Thank you for joining me. I want to share with you excerpts of recent testimony from the United States House of Representatives Energy and Commerce Committee examining the national problem of psychiatric bed shortages. While the discussion you will see is focused on the national issue of insufficient resources for care for those among us who are mentally ill, it offers insight into a critical problem facing Southern Alameda County and the short-sighted, underfunded policies that significantly affect families who confront these issues on a daily basis. As elsewhere, individuals in our community who exhibit symptoms of mental illness often have nowhere to go. No local access to county or state mental illness treatment facilities. Most often they're brought to an emergency room department for help. And as you will see in the program, the trends we see here in our emergency room are no different than what is happening at the national level. Frequently, these patients need to be admitted for longer term care. But since beds in mental health facilities are limited and insufficient in number, the patients end up being boarded in the emergency room or released back into the community. Without adequate follow-up care, many return to the emergency department time after time. Others end up in jail because there is no other place to house them and to keep them from harming themselves or others. In the following program, you will see compelling testimony from families and professionals who live with the daily realities of mental illness. Much of what you will hear could be seen on any given day within the cities that encompass Washington Township Healthcare District and at the hospital's emergency department and clearly supports the need for expanding psychiatric services to this area. Thank you for taking the time to watch this program and learn more about this important issue. In order to find solutions, we need to bring awareness to the problem and start this discussion. Hopefully these hearings will begin that discussion locally. Good morning. Um, I now convene this morning's hearing entitled, Where Have All the Patients Gone Examining the Psychiatric Bed Shortage? Right after the December 14, 2012 elementary school shooting in Newtown, Connecticut, the Subcommittee on Oversight and Investigations began a review of federal programs and resources devoted to mental health and serious mental illness. Recent events have shown the continuing importance of this inquiry, including the September 2013 Navy Yard shooting just a couple of miles from where we sit this morning in Washington, D.C. Other tragic cases like Sang Hui Cho, James Holmes, Jared Lochner, and Adam Lanza all exhibited a record of untreated, severe mental illness prior to their crimes. It is a reflection of the total dysfunction of our current mental health system that despite clear warning signs, these individuals fail to receive inpatient or outpatient treatment for their illnesses that might have averted these tragedies. And they all leave us wondering, what would have happened if? What would have happened if Aaron Alexis was not just given sleeping pills at the VA hospitals? Or if there was an available hospital bed or outpatient treatment available for others who later became violent, involved in a crime, unable to pay their bills, or tossed, or tossed out on the street? Part of the problem is that our laws on involuntary commitment are in dire need of modernization. It is simply unreasonable, if not a danger to public safety, that our current system often waits until an individual is on the brink of harming himself or others, or has already done so before any action can be taken. The scarcity of effective inpatient or outpatient treatment options in the community, as illustrated by the premature release of Gus Deeds, son of former Senator, son of Virginia Senator Cree Deeds, from an emergency custody because of the lack of psychiatric hospital beds, is also to blame. And it is a sad, sad ending. In our heart, we cannot begin to imagine a parent's grief when told there is no place for your son or daughter to get help. Nationwide, we face an alarming shortage in inpatient psychiatric beds that, if not addressed, will result in more tragic outcomes. This is part of the long-term legacy of deinstitutionalization, the emptying out of state psychiatric hospitals resulting from the financial burden for community-based care being shifted from the state to the federal government. With the deinstitutionalization, the number of available inpatient psychiatric beds has fallen considerably. The number of beds has decreased in the 1950s from 559,000 to just 43,000 today. Back in the 1950s, half of every hospital bed 
was a psychiatric bed. We need to close those old hospitals. We needed to close those old hospitals that had become asylums, lockups, and quite frankly, they were dumping grounds. But where did all the patients go? They were supposed to be in community treatment. They were supposed to be on the road to recovery. But for many, that simply did not happen. The result is that individuals with serious mental illness who are unable to obtain treatment through ordinary means are in too many cases homeless or entangled in the criminal justice system, or in, including being locked up in jails or prisons. Right now, the country's three largest jail systems in Cook County, Illinois, Los Angeles County, and New York City have more than 11,000 prisoners receiving treatment on any given day and are, in fact, the largest mental health treatment facilities in the country. These jails are many times larger than the largest state psychiatric hospitals. Not surprisingly, neither living on the street nor being confined to a high security cell block are known to improve the chances that an individual's serious mental illness will stabilize, let alone prepare them where possible for eventual recovery into the community, to find housing, to find jobs, and to find confidence in their future. It is an unplanned, albeit entirely unacceptable consequence of deinstitutionalization that the state psychiatric asylums, dismantled out of concern for the humane treatment and care of individuals with serious mental illness, have now effectively been replaced by confinement in prisons and homeless shelters and tied to hospital beds. What can we do earlier in people's lives to get them evidence-based treatment, community support, and on the road to recovery, not the road to recidivism? Where is the humanity in saying there are no beds to treat a person suffering from acute schizophrenia, delusions, agitation, and aggression, and so that what they're offered is sedation and being restrained in an ER hospital bed for days? This morning, to provide some perspective on the far-reaching implications of the current psychiatric bed shortage and to hear some creative approaches to address it, we'll be receiving testimony from individuals with a wealth of experience across the full range of public services consumed by the seriously mentally ill across our nation. These include Lisa Ashley, the mother of a son with serious mental illness who has been boarded multiple times at the emergency department, Dr. Jeffrey Geller, a psychiatrist and co-author of a report on the trends and consequences of closing public psychiatric hospitals, Dr. John Mark Hershon, an ER physician and task force chair in a recent study of the emergency care compiled by the American College of Emergency Physicians, Chief Mike Biasati, immediate past president of the New York State Association of Chiefs of Police and parent of a daughter with serious mental illness, Sheriff Tom Dart of Cook County, Illinois, Sheriff's Office, who oversees one of the largest single-site county pre-detention facilities in the United States, the Honorable Steve Leifman, Associate Administrative Judge, Miami-Dade County Court, 11th Judicial Court of Florida, Gunther Stern, Executive Director of Georgetown Ministry Center, a shelter and clubhouse caring for the Washington, D.C. homeless, Hakeem Rahim, a mental health educator and advocate. Lamar Ederson, a clinical mental health counselor and director at large of the American Mental Health Counselors Association. And Dr. Arthur Evans, Jr., Commissioner of Philadelphia's Department of Behavioral Health and Intellectual Disability Services. I thank you all for being with us this morning and giving us so much of your time. I'm now going to um, swear you in so you're aware the committee is holding an investigative hearing and we have the practice of taking testimony under oath. Do any of you object to taking to oath? Taking oath. All right. The chair then advise you that under the rules of the House and the rules of the committee, you're entitled to be advised by counsel. Do any of you desire to be advised by counsel during your testimony today? It should be an issue. Thank you. In that case, if you all would please rise and raise your right hand and I'll swear you in. Do you swear the testimony you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Yeah, you may now sit down and you are under oath and subject to the penalty set forth in Title 18, Section 1001 of the United States Code. We'll now recognize each of you to give a five-minute opening statement recognized first, Ms. Ashley. And make sure your microphone is on and it's pulled close to you. Thank you. Hello and good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here to tell my son's story with the emergency room department in my vicinity. I am a nurse practitioner with a master's degree. I've been in pediatric practice for 38 years, but that's not why I'm here today. I'm here as a mother of a son who is now 27 and diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia two years ago. It's been a long and difficult story, which I share with many parents. My son was about 20, 21 years old when I knew something was wrong, but it wasn't sh until he went homeless when he was in LA and went missing for three weeks that I knew for sure. Of course, he saw nothing wrong. When I was finally able to locate him, I brought him back to Sacramento. He was delusional, thinking the FBI was watching him, 
There were satellites in the sky monitoring his thoughts, having auditory hallucinations, could not have a conversation, laughing to himself and not caring for his hygiene. Prior to this, my son was extremely bright, received 740 out of 800 on his math SATs, accepted to seven universities for mechanical engineering. He, his bizarre behavior went on for months, but he refused to see a psychiatrist. He was bonded to his primary medical pr provider who saw him for several times trying to get him on a hold. I felt helpless and extremely frustrated. Even calling the police did not help because they did not feel, or feel that he was a harm to himself or others. I'm specifically going to tell a story regarding his hospital emergency department stays three times over a two-year period. Each time, I struggled with pain and anguish to see my beautiful son taken in custody, especially for the first time, because he didn't know how sick he was and how very confused as to why he could not go home with me, and I cried my heart out. The first time was in May 2012. He had been sick over a year before I was able to get him some help. His first time in the emergency room was approximately 12 hours. I couldn't believe the, they had to hold him there that long, not knowing there was a shortage of psych beds in the county. He was then transferred to a psych facility locally and remained two weeks, just as long as my insurance would allow him. Although it was very difficult to have my son hospitalized, I know he was in good hands and re relieved some of my anxiety, but still it was nothing like I had ever been through and having to trust a system that was so foreign to you and difficult, I worried every minute. The second time was not quite as smooth. In January, 19, in January of 2013, my son asked voluntarily to be taken to the hospital because his head felt like it was on fire. He was anxious and very distressed. I dropped everything knowing that he was asking to go. He must have felt pretty bad. I brought him to the same emergency room that morning. We reached the triage nurse. I identified myself as an employee and a nurse practitioner. I explained my son was a paranoid schizophrenia, a schizophrenic and he was in psychosis. I tried to remain calm as the triage nurses took his blood pressure and temperature and then assigned him to a gurney in the hallway with at least other eight other patients, which included children, all waiting to be seen by a doctor. It was not long before my son started to get agitated and wanting to leave. The RN called the social worker to help intervene. She could not quiet him down. As he tried to approach the exit, the emergency room policeman tried to stop him by holding him back. His behavior escalated. My son was screaming at him not to touch him. When schizophrenics are in psychosis, they do not want to be touched. In front of all the children and adults waiting in the hallway, the police officer wrestled him to the ground and handcuffed him. I tell you this because I brought him to the hospital for medical treatment, not for police handcuffing him and their intervention escalating his psychosis made it worse. If he had been able to go to some kind of psych facility, he would have gotten the medical attention rather than police attention. Doctors would have known how to deal with him, calm him down, isolate him from others. The emergency room is not a quiet place and they are not trained to deal with psychiatric illnesses and certainly not me serious mental illness. They then placed him on a gurney and put him in four point restraints and then medicated him. He was there on a Friday morning, the whole day, all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and all day Monday afternoon because they could not find a psych bed anywhere. He stayed in a room tied to his bed for four days, heavily medicated him. Seeing him helpless tied to a bed for days was like a nightmare. This was my son and I was helpless except to keep him company and try to reassure him things would be all right. I was angry they couldn't find him a place. Does it really take that long to find a psych bed? Finally, on Monday, I was told there was an opening at a hospital in San Francisco, which is 100 miles east of Sacramento. They finally took him there later that day. I was unable to be involved in his care because he was so far away, except for weekends. It was very frustrating. I didn't understand why he needed to go away, so far away from his family member who cared and loved for him. By the way, if I hadn't had private insurance, he never would have gone to that hospital because they don't accept public monies. So because I had private insurance, they took him. Otherwise, who knows, he might still be there. The third time was in November. Again, his head was burning and screaming at, voices were screaming at him. I took him back to the hospital. They put him on a gurney in the hallway again. 
I was able to be proactive and talk with other providers prior to this and set up a plan so that the second intervention would never, ever happen to him again. I was able to make some phone calls and after two days get him into a local psych facility where he stayed another three days. My son is fairly stable since that time in November. He has not required any additional hospitalization, but attends regular psychiatric visits and takes his medications regularly. And I pray every day that he continues to stay out of the emergency room because there are no other alternatives for him. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ashley. I appreciate your moving testimony. Dr. Hirschhorn, you're recognized for five minutes. In emergency departments throughout the country, we emergency physicians expect the unexpected. This is what we're trained to do. Even so, there's one thing that we all know is happening, increasing demand by patients in need of acute psychiatric care. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, thank you for this opportunity to testify today on behalf of the American College of Emergency Physicians. ASEP is the largest specialty organization in emergency medicine, with more than 32,000 members in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. My purpose today is to help you understand that we're in the midst of a national crisis, facing a dramatic increase in vulnerable mental health patients seeking emergent and urgent care. America's mental health services are experiencing increased demand while concurrently receiving decreased funding, which drives psychiatric patients to the ED or emergency department. In 2000, psychiatric patients to the ED <clears throat> accounted for only 5.4% of all ED visits, but by 2007, that number had risen to 12.5%, well over a doubling of the number of psychiatric patients. Until more services and fundings are made available to address this crisis, EDs will be the safety net for these patients. This is due in large part to the Federal Emergency Medicine Treatment and Labor Act, EMTALA, which mandates medical screening evaluation and stabilization for anyone seeking care in an ED. Additionally, unlike many other health care settings, EDs are open 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year. Emergency physicians do their best to provide care to patients with psychiatric conditions, but the ED is not the ideal location for these services. ED crowding leads to delays in care and have been associated with poor clinical outcomes. For patients with mental health and or substance abuse problems, prolonged ED stays are associated with increased risk of worsening symptoms. Without available appropriate inpatient resources for admitted patients, these patients wait or are boarded in the ED until an inpatient bed becomes available or an accepting facility can be found. When the normal capacity of the ED is overwhelmed with boarded patients, there remains absolutely no room for surge capacity, which would be critical in the event of a man-made or natural disaster. In a recent ASEP survey, 99% of emergency physicians reported admitting psychiatric patients daily, while 80% said that they were boarding psychiatric patients in their EDs. Acutely ill psychiatric patients require more physician, more nurse, and more hospital resources. ED staff spends more than three times as long looking for a psychiatric bed as they would for a non-psychiatric patient. Other factors contribute to the extended ED boarding times for psychiatric patients, including defensive medicine or threat of legal action, required pre-authorization for inpatient services, medical clearance prior to psychiatric evaluation, substance abuse-related issues, and inadequate outpatient services. As can be seen, many of these issues are systems issues and beyond the control of the clinician. It is imperative that access to high-quality inpatient and community health, mental health care be a priority. I go into further detail on, these, on suggested solutions in my written testimony, but some important ones include full capacity protocols to improve the movement of admitted patients to inpatient floors, separate psychiatric ED and behavioral health annexes to help address urgent and emergent psychiatric needs, regionalized care and telemedicine to help efficiently and effectively address increasing demand, as well as the elimination of out-of-network insurance issues and community state mental health buy-in. Let me leave you with this. The increasing burden of mental illness in this country combined with the lack of resources to care for these individuals is a national crisis. Mass deinstitutionalization of mental health patients over the past few decades did not result in successful community integration of individuals needing psychiatric services, in part because the necessary services and funding were not put in place for adequate community support. 
systematic changes are needed in the way we care for these individuals with mental illness in, in this country. How we deal with these vulnerable individuals is an important measure of who we are as a society. Necessary resources must be made available for additional inpatient and outpatient treatment beds with the corresponding professional staff, as well as for critically needed research. Otherwise, mental health services will continue to de deteriorate, and these individuals, often our family members, will continue to be at risk for abuse and neglect, seeking care in EDs for lack of any other support. I thank you for your attention to this alarming problem. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Chief Biasati. You can put that microphone right up next to you, please. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Murphy and Ms. Degette. I'm the immediate past president of the New York State Association of Chiefs of Police and Chief of Police of New Windsor, New York. I'm in my 38th year of service. My wife, Barbara, who is a psycho psychologist, is here today with me. We have a daughter with schizophrenia who has been involuntarily hospitalized in excess of 20 times. Barbara and I met when she, like many moms, turned to the police for help when her, now our daughter, became psychotic, disruptive, and threatening. She was self-medicating, unemployed, unemployed, and deteriorating despite my wife's heroic efforts to help her. Then she went into assisted outpatient treatment. It saved her life. <clears throat> in 2011, while at the United States Naval Postgraduate School's Center for Homeland Defense and Security, I published a survey of over 2,400 senior law enforcement officers titled Management of the Severely Mentally Ill and Its Effects on Homeland Security. It found the mentally ill consume a disproportionate percentage of law enforcement resources. Many commit low-level crimes. <clears throat> 160,000 attempt, attempt suicide, 3 million become crime victims, and 164,000 are homeless each year. The survey essentially found that we have two mental health systems today serving two mutually exclusive populations. Community programs serve those who seek and accept treatment. Those who refuse or are too sick to seek voluntary treatment become law enforcement responsibilities. <clears throat> Officers in the survey were frustrated that mental health officials seemed unwilling to recognize or take responsibility for this second, more symptomatic group. <clears throat> Ignoring them puts patients at risk the public, and police. It costs more than keeping care within the mental health system. As an example, there are fewer than 100,000 mentally ill in psychiatric hospitals, but over 300,000 in jails and prisons. The officers I surveyed pointed out the drain on resources it takes to investigate, arrest, fill out paperwork, and participate in the trials of all of them. Add to that the sheriffs, district attorneys, judges, prisons, jails, and corrections officers it takes to manage each of them and you see the scope of the problem. Many more related incidents like suicides, fights, nuisance calls take police time but don't re result in arrest or incarceration. Overly restrict commitment standards and the shortage of hospital beds are major sources of frustration for officers. Hospitals are so overcrowded they often can't admit new patients and discharge many before they are completely stable. They become what we call round trippers or frequent flyers. One, offer, one officer referred to it as a human catch and release program Anyone who asks for help is generally not sick enough to be admitted, so involuntary admission, that is, being a danger to self or others, becomes the main pathway for treatment. Officers are called to defuse situations and then have to drive, in some cases, hours to transport individuals to hospitals and then wait for hours in the emergency rooms, only to find the hospital refuses admission because there are no beds or that the commitment standard is so restrictive. The only remaining solution for our officers is to arrest these people with serious mental illness for whatever minor violation exists, something that we are loath to do to sick people who need medical help, not incarceration. Finally, while everyone knows that everyday mental illness is not associated with violence, untreated, serious mental illness clearly is. The officers in this survey deal with that reality every day. You and Congress dealt with it when Ronald Reagan and Gabriel Giffords were shot, two guards in the Capitol building were killed, and the Navy Yard shooting happened. Representatives Deget, Gardner, and Griffiths have experienced the worst of the worst in their states. We have to stop pretending that violence is not associated with untreated serious mental illness. We have to pre stop pretending that everyone is well enough to volunteer for treatment and then self-direct their own care. Some clearly are not. As I wrote in the intro of the survey, police and sheriffs are being overwhelmed dealing with the un unintended consequences of a policy change that in effect removed the daily care of our nation's severely mentally ill population from the medical community and placed it with the criminal justice system. This policy change has caused a spike in the frequency of arrests of severely mentally ill persons, 
prisons, jail populations, as well as homeless populations, has, and has become a major consumer of law enforcement resources nationwide. If I could make one recommendation, it would be to prevent individuals from deteriorating to the point where law enforcement becomes involved. Return care and treatment of the most seriously ill back to the mental health system. Make the seriously mentally ill first in line for services rather than last. As a law enforcement officer and a father, I know that treatment before tragedy is a far better policy than treatment after tragedy. Thank you so much. So as we go into uh, comments here uh, or questions from members of Congress, I just want to uh, have a special thank you for this panel. We've had a number of hearings and panels on this issue of mental health, and, uh, and I recognize members have had very busy lives and some are at other hearings and other areas, but uh, for those members who missed your testimony, I think their lives are the poorer for it. Um, and as I watch how someone will walk through the system, it's pretty difficult. So let me recognize myself for five minutes. Ms. Ashley, your experience is related to us in your testimony concerning your son's admission and boarding in a local ER from hours to days. I mean, it's alarming to us. Um, so were there any other places in the area, or were you informed of any other place in the area where you could have taken your son instead of having those long delays in the hospital? You mean another emergency room? Yes. Oh, well, my insurance only pays for the hospital that we went to. Okay. And, and, and Dr. Hirschman, in this uh, case, and we had heard this also in the, um, for example, in 60 Minutes when, when uh, State Senator Creed Dees was talking about his own son, he couldn't find a place. Um, what, what, is that part of the problem that occurs, too, with emergency rooms in terms of getting someone to f find? Yeah, the issue of finding an inpatient facility can be very problematic. <clears throat> you have to find a place that's going to accept that patient and historically, there may have been insurance issues as well. Uh, and so, you know, in Maryland, we've tried to de devise mechanisms to improve this. One of the things we have now is a kind of a central um, listing of the hospitals that have inpatient facilities that have beds available. But even that is problematic, getting the hospitals to buy into it. So this is a traditional problem, this is, especially if you have someone who's got a dual diagnosis, perhaps they you know, an uh, adolescent with, with bipolar and substance abuse. They can wait. I've had friends had patients wait for 13 days in their emergency department looking for a place to stay. So the, the, a lot of this is the lack of a kind of systematic structure to support these people who are either coming in because they have acute needs or because of, of their social circumstances. So the, the idea to have that improved structure both from a mental as well as social perspective I think are very critical. Yeah, and, and I want to ask you, Ms. Ashley, as, as, a mom, as a fellow mom here, you, you would m much rather, you, you as, as a nurse, you identified that your son had severe psychiatric problems from an early stage, but you didn't have any, any recourse to get him the kind of treatment he needed except for continually taking him to the emergency room. Is that what, what I hear you saying? Yes, that's right. His, um, I worked very closely with his primary medical provider who obviously knew there was something wrong with him, but my son would continuously deny going to, this, to the emergency room to get right. psychiatric evaluation. He, the psychiatric people were even willing to come to his medical appointment to evaluate him. That's how tight our um, community was, and still my son would say no, he would not go. Right. So I actually had to set up a situation where he went to the emergency room to get lab work done and then and have him received by the psychiatrist and his primary medical provider to put him on a hold. So I would say that each jurisdiction, each region, each state is different. It's a little hard to say, but as a general rule, access to care in rural settings is much more difficult. And the other thing to recognize is that even if you have insurance, Insurance doesn't mean access, because you have to fi find someone who can take that insurance and who will be there to give you the, the services. So as a general rule, the rural settings and the areas in which there's fewer services are disproportionately impacted. I, I think, again, that you know, not just psychiatric care, but many types of care, is you have to look for creative solutions. And one of the solutions for that is regionalization of care. So for example, if you've got a regional center of excellence for, for psychiatric care, to be able to utilize that either through telemedicine so they can do evaluations long distance or in a setting in which they don't have a, a psychiatric uh, provider there, or there's a way that you can use that regionalization to help improve the care, I think is one potential model. Um, I think we need to do research to look for better ways to, to be able to provide care, recognizing that uh, our technology and that there's an increased demand, but our ability to perhaps meet that demand can be, can be adjusted. Okay. 
Ms. Ashley, I see you shaking your head. You like the idea of using the telemedicine concepts? Uh, yes, at UC Davis, we already use telemedicine for uh, medical diagnoses and so forth. And so I definitely can see telemedicine with good case management follow-up definitely would be very helpful to the family and the consumer. Our main concern law enforcement-wise are the seriously mentally ill group that are unaware of their illness. I mean, that, that's where it lies, where in the problem lies for us. The police departments, your county directors know who these certain group of people are because we deal with them every day. Uh, and there's, there's answers to, that we can deal with that. Uh, in a case that we had not long ago, we had a woman severely mentally ill, went into a house, no one was home, took the pit bull and put it in a closet, went upstairs, took all the clothing out of the woman's clothes, put, him, put her dishes from upstairs, downstairs, moved all the pictures, spent the day. The woman came home, the homeowner, and walked in on her and, of course, you know, had a cow right then and there, called the police, the police come, and she was totally out of her mind, uh, psychotic, carrying on. So when I arrived at the police station on a different matter, I heard this screaming coming from our booking area. She was in the booking area, you know, voices were telling her and she was complaining she was being raped by whatever at the time while she's sitting there. So I made a decision at that point, which a lot of people don't do, but being familiar with this topic, I said, listen, we're not, we're not arresting her for burglary. I said, we need to, what, she's going to go to the, to the psych unit, but I'm going to send a letter with her saying that she is obviously dangerous. She could have been killed. Whoever came home could have shot and killed her, most likely to happen. I said, if we arrest her, she's going to go to the county jail. She's going to be a major problem for them. From there, our, our officers are going to go out to grand jury where they're going to move to indict her for whatever. She'll be in jail for a year before they decide that she's so mentally ill that she can't stand trial. And then she'll be back here again. I said, so let's get her into the system now and put her, put her through that service. But I accompanied that with a letter to our county mental health director saying, I strongly suggest that you know she, she has proven to be dangerous. She has a long history to herself, mostly. Um, I suggest that you enter her into the assisted outpatient treat, treatment program. This program then, they provide the services to her through this program. She has not been a problem since. They monitor to make sure that she's in some kind of treatment. And as long as she's in treatment, she's not a problem. However, if we went the legal system as we normally would do, we would be dealing with her every few weeks because she has anisognosia. She does not believe she's ill. And, and, and I know, uh, you know stigmatism is a big concern. And, and I, my wife and I both pray for the day that our daughter has the insight that Mr. Rahim has into her illness, because I believe if she had that insight, she could seek these, the, the, what everybody's talking about, care in the community. It's been 20 years almost, and she has, does not have that insight. Um, Ms. Ashley, I do want to go back to one of the issues that, that's been raised. And you know, I know we're discussing um, coverage, medical coverage, um, how, you know, I know some of my colleagues are saying if we just had a bigger Medicaid system that that might actually help the situation. Um, you know, that obviously you know we're dealing with that every day here, uh, trying to make our health care coverage system work better. If I remember correctly from your testimony and previous questions, you said you have private insurance that your son um, was able to receive treatment under. Is that correct? Yes, it is. I have him as a uh, disabled adult under my insurance. Okay. So you actually had insurance coverage, but still had the difficulties. It wasn't just an issue of here's my insurance card, therefore I'm going to get mental health services for my son. Right. In fact, I'm denied, he is denied some services in the community because he does have private insurance. I see. Okay. Um, even though he has SSI and Medi-Cal, they have no um, way to bill the insurance to get it denied mm -hmm. and then go on Medi-Cal. Mm -hmm. So um, that's, I don't even have access to a lot of the support services uh, that are available in my community mm -hmm. because he's on private insurance. And people have even told me to take him off private insurance. Okay, see that, that's obviously... And, and really, having private insurance is what gets him hospitalized quickly because mm -hmm. the lights go off when, the, when they see that I have private insurance ah. versus Medi-Cal or Medicaid. I see. Um, Mr. Visati, you had... Um, one of the things that I would like to clarify, even just for committee, is the difference between civil commitment and uh, forensic commitment, if you can answer that question, because I think that will help us as well. Because I think sometimes we do find ourselves, um, again, struggling with the situation of those who do not acknowledge that they have a problem, and yet they are having a psychotic episode. And that, that is, you know, that's where the problem lies. The, the <clears throat> police will bring the person from their home or from wherever the instance occurs to the 
uh, emergency room, usually against their will, mm -hmm. under, under a state code for imminent dangerousness. And then they're relying on the interview at the hospital for the, the um, psychiatrist to make a determination that they meet the standards to hold for a 72-hour mm -hmm. period for evaluation for commitment under that standard. So I think the, Dr. Geller could probably help me with the difference between the, the civil. I'm more familiar with how we would do it. Ms. Dr. Geller, would you like to expand on that then? Sure. Uh, every state has its uh, Mental Health Act, and that allows people to be uh, civilly committed usually on a standard of dangerous to self, dangerous to others, or uh, gravely in need of care, and there's no crime involved. Mm -hmm. A forensic commitment would mean that a person has been uh, charged and booked, uh, and then they're going to be committed, usually initially, for determination of competency to stand trial, criminal responsibility, or both, mm -hmm. that you heard about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, if they uh, cannot stand trial or are found not guilty by reason of insanity, then they can be further committed under a criminal statute of that state. Okay. And yes, Dr. Hirshen? I think it may be state by state, but in my state what happens is there's a fixed number of inpatient beds. And these individuals who are on forensic, um, not the ones who have been convicted, but they're often the, the, the pretrial folks, mm -hmm. will be taking up the beds that I'll be looking for, for you know, from the emergency department. So, so it, it doubly impacts it because it then backs up my system because they're being the forensic folks are being housed in that system. And if I could add from a law enforcement aspect, most of the people that we're talking about, we're bringing in not because of crimes. We're bringing in because of just Therapy. bizarre activity or mm -hmm. dangerousness. Mm -hmm. uh, the criminal aspect, we would have to make an arrest, and it would go through the jail system, and they would arrange for psychiatric evaluation. Uh, uh, Chief Biasati, if I could ask you, uh, you know, you've described, obviously, law enforcement as being the front line on uh, counteracting the impacts of serious mental illness in the community. What, what kind of burden is this on your resources and your department? Well, that's, that's the problem. That's, where I, uh, that's what my paper focused on, and it was that most police agencies are, are very small in this country. The big cities are the anomalies. So, uh, for instance, in my department, which is considered mid-size with a staff of, uh, authorized staff of 50 officers, we will have three or four cars per shift, a minimum of three on the road per shift. So normally when we deal with a severely mentally ill person who is acting violent, it requires at least two of our officers. So that's two out of three people uh, available. Now we have one officer uh, for a municipality, a good-sized municipality, until those officers are free. A lot of times the ambulance can't take them because they're too combative, and the hospital wants you to stay with them while they're in the emergency room until they make a determination as they're staying, which is because if they decide they're not staying, they don't want this psychotic person in their lobby, and you need to take them back to where you came with from. So it, 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 it is a great depletion of resources for law enforcement nationwide, especially those in the rural areas. You know, I actually was a city prosecutor for about six years before I came here, and that was, um, that was always the thing, and I appreciate what you said you do, because sometimes you know they, they don't need to be incarcerated. They need to get help. And being able, because not every department does it that way. So I want to commend you for that. Well, it's approach. difficult because you also have a crime victim that doesn't understand why the person that broke into their house is not going to jail. Right. So you have to have cooperation on a lot of levels. But also to that end, what I wanted to bring out quick is uh, I got to work with Governor Cuomo's office on the SAFE Act, the back end, Kender's Law. And one thing that I think we're, we're hopeful is going to make a change is one of the changes in Kender's Law mandates that uh, in prison settings, those who are receiving psychiatric care in the prison will be uh, evaluated upon release for inclusion into an assisted outpatient treatment program, which hadn't happened before. Before that, your time is up and you're out the door and you, there goes your treatment. So we're hoping that that's going to make changes and uh, lessen recidivism. Great. Thank you very much. Chief, you, you referred to Kendra's Law, and I just wanted to put in the record what that is. Um, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. I understand what this is. It's a law that was passed in New York that establishes more um, structured treatment combined with resources across the mental health system. And it's designed to get treatment to folks earlier on without having them participate in the penal system like, Mr. Dart, like Sheriff Dart was talking about or in the emergency room system. It really, it's designed to get them treatment 
but of course you have to have an investment to do that of resources the chairman and I were up here talking about this, and if you did have this investment of resources and you were really able to implement things like this, it would actually probably save money because you wouldn't be putting these people in incarceration or in very expensive, um, in very expensive ER uh, situations. Every single person here is nodding their head. I'd like to just, just say that for the record. <laughs> and um, thank you very much. If I could say the shame of it is we have 45 states that have the very similar law, but very few use it. Because they're not probably not putting the resources into it, That's right? That's correct. Yeah, thank you. And we're going we're gonna to try to work on to see what the, what the federal partnership that we can have with all 50 states to help help this along. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And, and, and Chief, along those lines, I understand, for example, California has the law in the books, but only Nevada County, only one county uses it. Yeah. In California, it's, it's optional by county right. and only one county, correct. And, and again, my thanks to this whole panel. Just a couple of suggestions. While you're in town, I hope you stop in on your member of Congress and say it's important to do some mental health reforms. Um, I'm committed to do this. I know Representative DeGette is too. Uh, and the Energy and Commerce Committee will be aware some things happen. Um, it's been since 1963, as you referenced, Dr. Gell, the last time this country really did some major mental health reforms in this country. It's long overdue. Uh, I know you're all passionate about this, uh, but I hope you energize your own members of Congress as well to help them understand the importance of moving forward on this. Um, even though you spoke for five minutes and you added a few minutes to other things, oftentimes people go through life and wonder if their voice makes a difference. It does. Yours does. And it will continue to echo throughout the House of Representatives in this nation. So I, I thank you a great deal uh, for all that. Uh, and recognize that, that um, Mr. Rahim, I think, and others have used the word hope. Uh, where there's no help, there is no hope. And we will make sure that we continue to work on that help. So in conclusion, again, thank you to all the witnesses and members that participated in today's hearing. I remind members they have 10 business days to submit questions for the record, and I ask that all uh, witnesses agree to respond promptly to the questions. Thanks so much. God bless.